Hello, friends, and welcome to the PrepWell podcast. I'm your host, Phil Black. And if you have an 8th, ninth, or 10th grader with big aspirations like the Ivy League or military service academies like West Point, ROTC, or athletic scholarships, boom, you've come to the right place. My specialty, my superpower, if you will, is preparing families for these competitive programs. I'll teach you what your child should do, when they should do it, and how you can help. So stick around and prepare to out-prepare. Hello, friends, and welcome to the PrepWell podcast. Today, I want to discuss summer planning. And I know it may seem a little early to think about the summer, and there's obviously still a lot of uncertainty with COVID, but it still warrants discussion. Even if it just plants a seed or helps to initiate conversations between parents and their children. And of course, it's also based on how motivated you are, how ambitious you are, and how far ahead of the game you would like to be. I'm going to use a conversation I had with one of my private prep wellers to illustrate not only the types of summer options students are thinking about these days, but why they are considering them and how they should think about each of these opportunities. Because of course, I know you can go to Google and type in summer options for teens and you'll get a ton of lists with ideas like internship and jobs and research projects and volunteering and community service, academic work and so forth. And for the most part, These are well-known ideas. There's nothing really new or insightful about a list like that. So what I'd like to do is to take this list a step further. And by the way, this is exactly what I do inside our PrepWell Academy videos every week. I take a generic concept that you can find on the internet, and I teach you how to use it specifically in your situation at exactly the right time. So if you're not yet a prep weller and you want this type of insight and guidance every week, both parents and students, then head over to prepwellacademy.com and enroll. But I digress with this public service announcement. So let's get back to the matter at hand. The goal in today's episode is not to just list activities and jobs. It's to reveal the thinking that goes on behind how a student might choose their summer activity or their activities, how to manage the uncertainty, how to hedge your bets, especially given the COVID factor. So I hope it's helpful. And by the way, the examples I will use may not be at all related to what you want to do this summer or what you're interested in. That's okay. Just listen to the thinking and the rationale behind the decision-making process and then apply those concepts to your specific situation. The private prep weller I'm going to use as an example here, let's call him Rick. Rick is a junior. He's a near straight A student, wants to be competitive at highly selective colleges, and wants to major in computer science. Obviously, there are many more dimensions to Rick's profile, but I don't want to bog us down in details right now. I want to focus squarely on how Rick is thinking about his summer opportunities. As we were talking, he proposed a few options. Option number one, finish a course that he started to get his private pilot's license. Option number two, have a friend's dad set him up with an internship at a local business. Option three, apply to internships at NASA and SpaceX or one of these other high-profile internships. And option four, continue working on a startup that he began in sophomore year as part of a school project. I'd like to go through each of these options and give you an idea of the pros and cons of each one and how they might fit into Rick's summer planning process. Let's start with option one, finishing up a course that he started to get his private pilot's license. Okay, this one's interesting. Getting a private pilot's license would be very impressive. I think anyone would agree with that. It takes a lot of time and studying and technical aptitude. It requires classroom work, time in the air, actually flying, challenging tests. There's a certain amount of courage and wits that you need to have about you to get up in the air like that and to take the controls of an airplane. This is also a highly regulated process. 
with a well-known and what I might call an authenticated path that would signal to admissions officers that this is a significant accomplishment. Rick actually had to perform at a very high level for a very long time to receive this highly sought after license. And he will get a lot of credit for that because admissions officers don't have to wonder whether or not this was actually all that impressive. They know it was. Now let's get back to whether this is a smart use of Rick's time and energy and money because this process is very time consuming and expensive. If Rick wanted to be an aeronautical engineer or a commercial pilot or a Navy or an Air Force pilot, then I really like the idea of spending the time and the effort to get the license because the alignment would be very tight. Obviously, someone who gets a private pilot's license is putting their money where their mouth is. If they're claiming that they intend to fly for a living or work in the aviation or the engineering industry, it demonstrates very strong and aligned interest, which is what you want in an ideal world. And Rick would get max credit for that. However, that's not really what Rick wants to do in the short or long term. Rick is interested in computer science. So where does the private pilot's license come in? Well, you could make the argument that the technical nature of flying and all of the computer-based systems and the electronics would be of interest to Rick, and they may in fact be interesting to him, but it's a bit of a stretch. Now, if flying was Rick's hobby, and he finished his license last year, and he's been flying recreationally, then it's a different story. Then the activity turns into something that's a unique extracurricular activity that adds a lot of dimension to Rick's profile. But to spend most, if not all, of his next four to six months specifically on getting this license, even though it's only tangentially connected to his ultimate goal, seems like it would crowd out a lot of other things that he could do to better demonstrate who he really is and what he wants to do in college and beyond. So while it's a great and interesting and unique ECA or extracurricular activity, Rick might not get enough bang for the buck, both literally and figuratively. And he would likely be better off looking for another meaty and significant project that's better aligned with his profile. Option two, have a friend's dad set him up with an internship at a local business. Okay, the background here is that Rick has a friend and his friend's dad is well-connected in the business world locally. And he claims that he'd be able to get Rick an internship at a small business if Rick wanted to. Not exactly sure what the business is or what the arrangement would be, but he promises he could definitely find him something. This is something nice to have in your back pocket but I'm not sure Rick wants to count on this as his primary ECA, his primary extracurricular activity over the next three to four months or over the summer. Yes, if he pulled this off, he'd be able to put, quote, internship on his application, which is better than nothing. But depending on the type of company and his duties and responsibilities, which we don't know right now, this opportunity, in my opinion, is not particularly high on the list. Now, I don't want him to dismiss it, but I don't really want him to put all of his eggs in that basket. In the best case scenario, maybe Rick would intern for a computer company and he would be able to put his computer science skills to work and learn about the industry. That would be nice. But the worst case scenario is that he works for some random media company doing research on trends or some other issue that Rick has really no connection to. This actually is a very common scenario with students in the summer. They have some vague promise, quote unquote, by a friend or a relative or a family member who says, oh, don't worry about it. I'll be able to get you something. And then you rely on that as your main summer opportunity. And it doesn't always work out that well. Specifics are important. And getting commitments is important. So I would leave this on the back burner, but don't count on it. Option number three, applying for a NASA internship or a SpaceX internship. These are the internships that show up number one, number two in a Google search when you're looking for teenage summer internships. And boy, do they look cool. 
They have big, bright photos of kids in spacesuits working on robots and drones, and it looks amazing. And wouldn't it be impressive if you could put NASA internship on your college application, especially for someone like Rick, who's interested in STEM and computer science? Great alignment, right? Yes, all of that is true. It's also true that tens of thousands of other ambitious teenagers are seeing and applying to those very same internships. This doesn't mean that Rick won't get selected, but obviously these are super competitive programs and I certainly would not want him to count on getting one of these incredible opportunities. So I still encourage him to apply and send in his best work and personal statement and resume because that's good training no matter what happens, but he sure, certainly shouldn't bank on getting picked. If he happens to get selected, then all bets are off. He can drop everything else, but he has to have a more realistic backup plan. So the advice here is to submit the applications and then forget about it. Option number four, the last option, continue working on a software startup that he began as a sophomore. So for a little context, the company that he started actually made some pretty good progress on creating software that solved an important database management problem. He actually entered it into a few business plan contests and did pretty well. Now, I don't want to give out all the details here for privacy reasons, but suffice it to say that he was getting some traction. In fact, the feedback was so promising that over the summer, he submitted a provisional patent application in an effort to lock in some of the key elements of the software. But since then, he has not really been working on the product or the company very much. And he was wondering whether it would be time well spent to re-engage with that product. Well, my answer, from what I know, is a definite yes. Let's think about this for a second. Rick created a software product that solved an entrenched database problem. He stood up a small business to support this product, even submitted a provisional patent application. To me, this is the beginning of an extracurricular activity that has a lot of legs. For one, it's something 100% aligned with his stated interest, computer science. Second, creating a product like this from scratch is difficult. It shows that he's innovative and he's got a great work ethic. Third, having the wherewithal to write up the specs for a provisional patent application is not for the faint of heart. So he'll get plenty of points for that. And four, starting a business from scratch provides so many learning opportunities from legal to sales, to marketing, design, capital raising, intellectual property issues, team management and dynamics, that going down this road, no matter the outcome, would give him endless content for his personal statement, his supplemental essays, his interviews, his major choice. This is absolutely an avenue well worth exploring. Just think about how much experience Rick will get by confronting all of the challenges that a startup will throw at him. And by the way, colleges love students like Rick who take the initiative and they have the confidence to build a business even with no experience. It's students like this who create the Facebooks, the Ubers, the salesforce.coms of the world. And the colleges want to get the credit for Rick going to their school, even if Rick drops out to start the next Instagram. This brings huge prestige to the college. So my advice to Rick was to go all in on his business, to attack as many challenging issues as possible as soon as he can, and to log those issues along the way. Now, whether this product or company ever gets off the ground is really irrelevant for Rick's purposes. If it does, great, that's a bonus. If it doesn't, he will have learned so much along the way and been able to represent those learnings on his college application that there's almost no downside. Now, I said almost no downside because there's a downside lurking. What I can see happening here, if we're not careful, and by the way, this is not uncommon, is that what sounds great on paper is much harder to execute in real life. What do I mean by that? 
Because when you don't have the structure of a real job or the schedule of a real internship or a boss who's telling you what to do, asking you, giving you tasks, and you're left to your own devices, guess what? There's a lot of room for error. There's a lot of room for procrastination, as it were. Now, Rick's a motivated student, but it didn't appear that he was so excited about the idea that he was living and breathing it, as most company founders are. In fact, he hadn't really engaged in the company business for a few months. So how motivated was he really? That can pose a problem, because if Rick goes all in on this idea and claims that he will run through walls to move this product forward, and no one is there to hold him accountable, will he actually do all of the things that I mentioned above on his own? That's a great question, and one that I left Rick to think about at the end of our call. Now, I offered to mentor him and provide him with hard deadlines and milestones that he has to hit in order to keep the project alive. And if he hits those milestones, great, he should keep going. If he was unable to meet these reasonable goals, then maybe he should think about abandoning it and trying to get something more structured, maybe one of those internships from his friend's dad. And luckily, Rick has parents as well that are going to help him monitor him because I can't be there every week. So his mom and his dad are going to establish some milestones as well to see if we can keep the momentum up. Because what I don't want to see happening is this sounds great on paper and four months go by and he doesn't have anything to show for it. So in the end, when I'm assessing options for students and their summers, I look at number one, how significant is the activity? Number two, how well known is the activity? In other words, will the admissions officer appreciate the activity and its difficulty level. Number three, how aligned is the activity with the student's stated interest or their major preference? And four, how realistic is this project for the student to execute? In Rick's case, I would prioritize his summer plans as follows. Number one, I would skip the private pilot's license lessons for now. It's too much commitment, for too little payback. Number two, apply to all of the whiz bang internships, the NASA internship, the Space Force internship, with your best work. Spend time on the application, spend time on the essay and the resume, and then assume you won't get it. Number three, keep your dad's friend's offer of a local internship opportunity alive and well. Stay in touch with him. Try to get some details if possible, and keep those irons in the fire. And lastly, number four, put nearly all of your effort into continuing to build the software product and the business more broadly and learn, learn, learn. If he can do this independently and face down the many bumps in the road that he will no doubt encounter for months on end, he will be rewarded with a winning story that will translate very well into his college applications. That's all I've got for you today, folks. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for the continued support. If you do know a parent with an 8th grader, ninth grader, 10th grader, 11th grader in high school that might find this episode helpful, please share it with them. You can do that by finding that small box with the tiny arrow pointing up. That's the share button. Click that button. Text your friends the link to this episode and give them a little note recommending that they give it a listen. If you have questions, comments, an idea for an upcoming episode, please reach out to me by email. Please DM me on Instagram, prepwell underscore academy. Check out our blog. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Visit us on Facebook. I would love to hear from you. Until next week, goodbye, good luck, and never stop preparing. This podcast is brought to you by PrepWell Academy. PrepWell Academy is my one-of-a-kind online mentoring program that delivers to your ninth or 10th grader a short, highly relevant video from me every week, every Sunday, in fact, where I give them a heads up about what they should be thinking about to stay ahead of the game. To get these valuable lessons into your child's hands, please head over to 
prepwellacademy.com and enroll your child today.